Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Park. I'm here to talk to you guys about um, building maintainable and observable applications on serverless architecture. Um, just to recap on what I'm going to be talking about is the overview of the serverless computing. Um, what we did with serverless in terms of monitoring as well as the implementation of the feature that we built and how to optimize performance uh, uh, in the serverless environments, which is uh, slightly different from containers or uh, uh, traditional server architecture. Um, and how do you monitor uh, the applications running on serverless architecture uh, and make it observable? A little bit about me. Um, I, uh, I'm a software engineer at SignalFX. Uh, I've been with the, company, with the company for a couple of years. Uh, I worked on the uh, application side of the uh, product as well as the serverless monitoring. Um, and I also did uh, some feature development uh, using serverless myself uh, and also uh, monitor them as well. So getting to know a bit about you guys. Um, so show of hands, uh, who of you guys have uh, serverless uh, running in production uh, today? Cool. And um, who uh, are planning to potentially use serverless architecture uh, in the next three to six months uh, for your production? Nice, nice. Quite a few of you guys there. All right, cool. So. Um, what is serverless, right? Uh, so why, why do we use serverless? Why is it becoming popular? Um, the reason uh, it is uh, picking up the steam uh, is because uh, it has minimal operational effort. Um, as I know uh, some of you guys might be in the pancake talk this morning, we talked about um, DevOps and uh, the split between development and operations. Um, serverless help us uh, only focus on, allow developer to focus on development and minimize operations. So you don't have to care as much about where it's running, how do you provision all those uh, servers or, or containers or configure, configure, configuring them. Um, you just build your own function and you run it. Um, and these are some of the server, serverless providers uh, uh, that are there. Um, they are mostly have the same characteristics. They, their, their charge model are slightly different. Um, they're, they're more, all of them are charging by execution time, uh, but uh, some of them charge by allocated memory, some of them charge it by um, consumed memory, uh, and some of them also charge by CPU that are consumed and allocated. Um, so why am I here? So what we did with uh, uh, serverless, uh, we at CineFX, we use AWS Lambda. Uh, we, we use AWS a lot, and we decided to try out Lambda. Um, and uh, many aspects of serverless computing uh, are the same across all the cloud providers. Uh, there are some gotchas here and there, but most likely uh, they're, they're transferable. Um, we have, like I said, implemented a feature uh, using uh, Lambda. Uh, we're handling public uh, traffic. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, it's minimal operational work, just development. Um, it, it's uh, working great for uh, mostly long tail, uh, you know, traffic coming in that you uh, need minimal uh, taken care of. Um, but what we found is that our customers and some of our uh, engineers report uh, slowness uh, in request response time. So uh, we decided to take a look at it and uh, to figure out what's going on. So these are the example of the uh, uh, one of our charts uh, handling uh, the durations of the functions. Um, as you can see, and this is in millisecond. Um, so as you can see, uh, there's some nice graph over there over the period of time. You know, there's some uh, spike in valleys, but nothing looks uh, you know out of ordinary. Uh, so what what's going on there, right? Um, in order to to explain a bit further on what's going on here, uh, we need to take a look at uh, the monitoring uh, 101 or observability 101. That is, if you have uh, multiple instances of uh, uh, functions running at the same time, um, they are reporting the data, uh, basically the same data, because uh, uh, now it's a serverless instances running the same function running at the same time. Unlike the servers or hosts, where you have like host parameter that you can dimensionalize uh, based on that, if all of them are sending the data to, uh, to, to, to the service uh, at the same, exactly the same time, uh, for example, in this case, uh, one, one server, uh, one instance of serverless might be sending you know, the number of 10, uh, be it like 10, 10 seconds or 10 milliseconds. The other is sending 20, and the third one is sending 30. Um, in order to visualize them or uh, uh, you know, calculate analytics on them, um, 
the default uh, roll-up, I would say, uh, uh, would average to 20, which sort of makes sense in general because you know if you have all the data, you want to roll up uh, the same data in the same data point, it becomes 20. The same thing happens when you do it uh, uh, horizontally over time. If you are to zoom out, you know, very far out, and you look at the day overall, and each data point might becomes you know five minutes interval. Um, if you have 10, 20, and 30 uh, in the same uh, p small period of time, matter of seconds, then you know you have to roll up the data point uh, into average of, of 20 the same way. Now, what does it mean in our case? Uh, uh, is that uh, in order to, to understand observability, the data points will be rolled up. And the roll up has many different forms. Uh, one could do sum, basically summing all the data together, uh, usually the use case of counter and, and things like that. Um, or we do average, which is what the default uh, usually is, and it usually makes sense. Or min or max or count of what, uh, what has happened. Right? Um, now, let's take a look at the data again, at what, what we have. Um, like I said so far, uh, oops, and PowerPoint just died on me. Hold on. All right. Sorry about that. Um, so. Rollups. Rollups is the action of uh, operating on multiple data points into one data point. Um, and it has many, many meanings uh, on, on, uh, depending on operations that we did. Uh, and you've got the flexibility of, of picking uh, the one that you want depending on um, the applications that you use. So what we did, let's take a look at the average that I had before on, on each of the function duration uh, data point. I changed it to max. So what happened is that uh, at each point in time, you can see that uh, the maximum uh, time spent on each of the functions actually spiked uh, quite, quite a lot, I would say. Um, so we want to figure out what, what's going on there, right? So serverless, uh, as you may already know, and I chatted with a couple of folks downstairs earlier yesterday, uh, doesn't mean that there's no server. Right? Serverless, on the other hand, uh, it just means that you are no longer managing your own server. You're using someone else's server. Um, and uh, behind the cloud, um, there are uh, container server and containers provisioned for you. And not only that, uh, it is configured and has its own life cycle. And this is important. Uh, now, I'll speak in, uh, a little bit on why it's important. Uh, but once you have that uh, in combination of everything, um, you get the, your nice uh, execution of your uh, Lambda function here, for, for example. So what's the difference? Why, why, why is serverless different from the traditional container or server architecture? Execution time varies because uh, the startup time and uh, the, the implementation inside uh, the code are different. It's stateless. What, what it means is that there's no longer a uh, mean to uh, maintain state, counter, or anything that you can maintain inside the code. In traditional container, where you know, the start of the server, you can initialize a bunch of stuff, and then when it, the request comes in, you just handle uh, those small requests. Now there's no state, so you cannot maintain those, uh, those things inside the, the code itself. And uh, one of the most important things I'm going to also talk about here is cold starts. Um, and, and why it's important into the serverless performance. So what does it mean by stateless? Uh, no state. Uh, traditionally, if you start a server or, or your service, it launched once, and you can initialize your code any way you want, for example, your crypto package, uh, your XML parser, and those kind of things. And it has multiple threads. And as time goes on, you can handle incoming requests. And it will just serve the request, and it will be very happy. Um, but in serverless, uh, that's not happening. That's not what's happening. Um, in serverless world, every ex single execution and incoming request, you spawn up the new server, uh, serverless instance. Uh, it's got initialized, a, a handle request, and that's it. The next request that comes in, the next one will be spawned up again, uh, handle request, and uh, that's it. So this is uh, basically what is going to happen uh, in the serverless world. So now, what is cold starts, and, and why do they happen? 
So uh, cold starts happen, uh, cold start described um, the, the, the behavior when the serverless is being started. Uh, it started from your container uh, that, that handles your serverless function being provisioned to your configuration, for example, CPU memory configurations uh, in, in the region that you want, in the location and availability that you want. Then um, your uh, container is configured with a network configuration and security configurations are applied. Uh, basically, you know, uh, if you put in under VPC, if you apply the IAM roles, if you have permissioning, um, all of that are applied on the fly. And then um, your code is uploaded to the container. So uh, basically, if you have uh, the code running, be it Python, Node, or Java, uh, the code plus all the dependency to the code is uploaded inside the container or mounted into the container. Then the actual code execution happens. We launch the applications, and be it uh, Node, or Java, or Python, or Golang, um, it's going to start up. Then it comes to the actual running of your function. Right? The last part is when you're, you're actually handling uh, uh, the request coming in that you want to process. Now, cloud providers do optimize this from time to time. So not every time you're going to hit with cold starts. Right? So uh, if you have your function running, function instance running, it just finished serving the previous request and the next request comes in, um, it might be uh, it might be handling uh, using the instance that you have there uh, already running uh, and executed right away. So none of the cold starts that happens earlier would, would be needed because uh, it's using the live instance of, uh, of, of the functions that's going on. Now, what does it mean? Uh, there's this concept called the law of leaky abstractions. The law of leaky abstractions uh, indicated that all non-trivial abstractions, to some degree, are leaky. Uh, in this case, uh, uh, serverless are meant to abstract out uh, the infrastructure that is uh, provided underneath, uh, so that you, have, you don't have to care about them, you don't have to uh, operate on them, but uh, it does impact the performance and overall uh, behavior of your function. So what makes it so cold? Uh, I mentioned uh, a couple of behavior of, of cold starts. Uh, network configuration, like I mentioned, um, uh, do get supply uh, to your container uh, from time to time uh, when you, when you uh, initialize that. Security configuration, same thing. Uh, runtime technology depends a lot. So uh, it varies a lot from, from uh, runtime to runtime. So Python is very fast from, from what we uh, measured. Node. It's, it's OK. Java is really slow uh, to start up a Java application in general. So you know, take your pick on what you want. These are the things that you can potentially optimize for. right? Uh, pr container provisioning and things like that are, are, have to be done regardless. So there's, no, there's nothing that you can avoid there. Now, let's talk about monitoring. How do you monitor them? Um, you can use the cloud provider uh, monitor, like CloudWatch or uh, other provider like GCP or Azure has its own monitoring system. Um, but it has a basic information uh, that's going on in, the, in, the, uh, in your serverless environment and its, ex its execution. Um, and then if you want to uh, instrument something different, uh, be it custom metrics or you know, what's going on inside its own its, 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 uh, execution, then it's going to be a little bit more difficult and uh, the cloud provider data can somewhat be, somewhat be lacky uh, and behind. And also, it's actually hard to build charts and dashboard and uh, do you know, complex analytics on the built-in uh, cloud provider uh, monitoring. So uh, what do we do? Right? So let's talk a little bit about how, how else do you monitor your serverless uh, environment. In the traditional old school uh, monitoring, you have your own Lambda function. Um, you would lock all the things out uh, to locks. Uh, basically, you can print out as much as you want, uh, whatever you want to instrument. Um, it takes uh, a little bit for, for the locks to, to be piped through from, from your function. Um, then you put in on the stream, right? So be it, you know, uh, in, in AWS, we can use uh, Kinesis Stream and Kinesis Firehose. Uh, it has its own pros and cons. But in this case, you have to handle your 
uh, stream, uh, basically, and uh, make sure it stays performant. You have to scale with it. And uh, in order to handle the scale, you also then have to monitor your stream. So this is the next thing that you have to, to you know, operate on and maintain. Then you send it to you know, your favorite uh, log provider uh, or aggregate aggregator. Or you can use your, another Lambda function to actually aggregate your logs and process your logs. And the uh, funny story here is that um, the Lambda function itself will then provide another log, which then you will process again, and you will become infinite loop. Uh, and you pay your cloud provider an uh, exorbitant amount of money for that. Um, then you visualize uh, the data that you got from, from what you processed. Right? So um, what we did with our Lambda function is that uh, we wrapped the Lambda function around, around our own wrapper. Uh, it's basically uh, another runtime uh, execution that, that handles uh, before and after your Lambda uh, get executed. So it can handle, uh, monitor the, you know, the startup time, uh, the execution time, and you know, uh, call starts, and all those kind of things. Um, and it sends the data directly you know, to, to SignalFX, where we can visualize uh, the data. And it happens in a matter of seconds. Um, in this case, it, it's maintainable because you don't have to have an, all the intermediate service in between that you have to also handle and monitor. Um, with low, maintain low maintenance, because you don't need to, to do any of that, and um, uh, very low latency, uh, because it just piped through directly to, to the uh, monitoring service. Now, what do we look for? What do you typically want to know in your Lambda function or as a serverless uh, environment? Uh, the duration is very important, how long your serverless function got executed. In this case, you have a breakdown of each of the function that you have. Um, the invocation count with the breakdown of like, you know, errors, the actual total invocation, and what's very important, like I mentioned before, it's the number of call starts that, that happens. Um, and you know, uh, that throttle, because, because you can have so, so much uh, serverless of functions uh, running at the same time uh, over the period of like a short period of time for each cloud provider, you might get throttle, uh, depending on how, how high limits uh, you have. Uh, and then errors. So you want to know what's the error rate of your uh, functions that's going on in real time. Uh, that's the most important thing. Now, how do you optimize for, 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 for the performance of your, of your serverless function? Uh, reducing impact of call starts is, is uh, one of the things that you could do. Um, like I mentioned before, network configuration, security configuration, uh, memory configurations. Um, uh, try, not, try not to have the things that you don't need. Reduce uh, uh, the scope uh, of the configurations. If your server, serverless doesn't need any private network configurations, then don't have that, because these things add to the complexity and the startup time uh, of your functions every single execution, um, as well as you know, re remove the unnecessary initialization of your code uh, so that it doesn't unnecessarily you know, do things that it does not need it. The other thing that we did, uh, and a lot of, a lot of uh, people uh, using serverless uh, doing, is having a warmer. The concept of a warmer is a periodic, periodic uh, uh, timer that keeps calling uh, your Lambda function with like, like a no-op flag. So, uh, so your function can be bootstrapped and initialized uh, without executing anything, so that when the time comes when you require uh, to do the real processing from the customer traffic, uh, the serverless function is already warm and live, and it can execute uh, the function right away without having to handle with all the provisioning and configuration. So like I said, it's the timer uh, that has a warmer, and it can, the most important thing here is the warmer can then also uh, warm multiple functions or multiple instances of the function, so you can also handle uh, uh, concurrency traffic. So this is what the example of the warmer function in the code. Uh, this is uh, the Lambda uh, code um, example. So as you can see here, we're just looping through uh, all the functions that we want to warm with the number of concurrency that we want. And then we actually invoke the, 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 that function with the parameter uh, that we want. Um, and then the next example is the handler of the function. So in, in, the, in the Lambda function itself, using our, our wrapper, 
um, we check if it's a warmer event, then you know we, we handle it as a warmer. We don't execute any, any uh, real thing. And then if it's a real traffic and not warming, then we actually execute the function uh, and, pro and move on. So with all that, what happened? Uh, we tested out with our, uh, our experiments uh, Lambda function. Um, we set a warmer to run every five minutes, triggering uh, 20 concurrent execution of the function. And this is what we got. So to explain, um, the green chart, the green line, is the number of uh, warmer, uh, concurrent warmer uh, that we issue to the function. So that is basically mean every five minutes, we are issuing 10, 20 requests for concurrent execution of the Lambda function. Um, the blue area below uh, is the number of cold stars that happen uh, uh, every now and then. So as you can see, that every five minutes we issue uh, 20 uh, uh, warmer requests, which result in um, 10 cold starts. So that means that you know uh, somehow 10 of our instances got destroyed and reclaimed, uh, you know, every five minutes or everything in between b before the five minutes. Now. When we have some traffic going into the Lambda function or handling the, the public traffic, you can see that the warmer is still happening every five minutes, and it's still doing 20 uh, concurrent execution. But the, uh, the actual call starts uh, do not happen as, as frequently anymore. You can see the shape being different. As you can see here, um, it becomes eight. So what it means is that some of the Lambda function uh, got kept alive longer. Uh, then otherwise it wouldn't have any traffic. But then you can see the spike in the cold starts that's, that, that's happening as well. So what it means is that um, some of the instances eventually got destroyed anyway. Now, the next uh, example is that when you have bursts of traffic, so this is incoming traffic request to our Lambda function, and you can see the number of our requests in the y-axis there. We have bursts of incoming traffic. Uh, and this is what our Lambda function, uh, uh, the same chart looks like. The, the warmer is still happening the same way, but then you can see the cold starts happen at that time uh, because of the, of the burst. So no matter how warm you kept your Lambda function, if bursts were to happen or the number of concurrency that is needed for the Lambda function at a certain time uh, is beyond the concurrency that you have reserved, uh, cold starts will bound to happen. And, but, but what happens afterwards is that if the burst is sustained, uh, no cold starts will be happening you know, uh, for the period of time that the, the, the uh, burst uh, keeps happening. So this is uh, normal traffic uh, under you know, uh, circumstances. So basically, if you keep the Lambda function uh, going uh, and you have the warmer and everything is nice and cool, you handle all the you know, normal traffic, um, what happened is that uh, what we found is uh, the, the amount of uh, uh, containers or Lambda function that got reclaimed and have to restart are inconsistent. Uh, what you can see here is that you can see uh, some of the core start happening, you know, 14, and some of them doesn't happen at all, um, and then, you know, some of them happen less frequently. So um, the behavior uh, in the end is not really guaranteed. Uh, on, on uh, you know, uh, the algorithm of it being reclaimed and cold start happening. As you can see there, what's going on. So um, in conclusion, uh, what we found is that containers uh, that handle the Lambda function uh, got replaced over time. No matter how hard you try, it will be reclaimed and, and, and destroyed. So cold starts are bound to happen uh, regardless. But the most important thing is that unused instances of Lambda function or serverless function uh, will be destroyed. So, so if, 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 if you don't keep them warm, then you know, it, it will for sure uh, be reclaimed. Now, to conclude, why, why are we talking about this? Because as I was composing these slides, uh, it becomes apparent that, that uh, it has a lot of problems. So why, why do we even try to, do, try to use Lambda function? I have to keep reminding myself that you know, as a developer, it is easy to develop and, and maintain because you just need to write the code and there's a place for you to run it uh, right away. With basically minimal operations, um, you don't have to uh, be maintain it yourself and the Lambda function that we have been using are performing very well. We, we have close to zero error rate, uh, the error that are not part of our code are close to zero, so uh, the bugs that we produce ourselves we have to fix. Um, 
minimal operations. Uh, you basically, you have to do anything. And you, the, the, the most important thing is you pay per use, right? So you don't, you don't pay for, uh, you know, uh, the, no traffic coming into your service. You only pay when you need to uh, and the execution, and you only pay for the memory that you allocate it. Uh, the thing that you have to be careful um, in, in the serverless world, like I mentioned before, is that it is stateless, so you don't want to maintain uh, any state in your function. In fact, you cannot maintain any state in your function. Um, you, you will want to use some other uh, external service that can handle uh, the information to your uh, function, for example, like uh, Redis um, or uh, other in-memory uh, caching tier uh, database outside that you can call out. The other the important thing that we talked about is cold starts. Um, basically, cold starts is about to happen. Uh, we just need to be able to ma manage and maintain them uh, in order to get the optimum performance of your uh, functions. And in the end, um, the, the paper on the first link uh, described in detail uh, uh, the, the performance of each of the cloud provider and the serverless uh, uh, performance and how it got reclaimed and how it got uh, shared tenant in each VMs and containers, uh, if you want to write down the URL there. Um, and then, you know, uh, we have the last link there is our uh, serverless uh, wrapper and some examples that, uh, that I have here in there. So that is it. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I will upload the slides uh, afterwards as well. So thank you.